Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. First of all, I want to apologize that I'm coming to you so late this evening. I had to get out to Spokane, Washington uh, from Great Falls, and we had a lot of trouble with uh, some of the flights getting over here. So instead of getting in on time, I'm, I'm quite a bit late. So I'm just going to produce one video tonight. And part of that was because of what you've been watching here, this piece of the jet stream just running right along the U.S.-Canada border. When we got on our uh, flight from Great Falls to Seattle, the pilot came on and said, we're going to be delayed because we're going to be flying into to a, a headwind of 150 miles an hour. We were staying to the south of this. The strongest winds are just a bit farther uh, to the north. And it's been this piece of the jet stream that's been quite problematic uh, for us for a while. Just looking back on December the 1st, a very windy day in parts of Montana, the Northern Plains and the Canadian Prairie, and also in the Columbia Basin here. While I was in Great Falls, we did see wind gusts that topped 70 miles an hour. We had some downed power lines that actually started um, some pretty nasty fires that unfortunately uh, burn some homes and also an elevator. But uh, you can see here how strong those winds uh, were just as of late. But overall, that jet stream pattern's given us this over the last seven days. It's been very warm across parts of the plains, that downslope flow we talked about. Plus, generally speaking, the jet stream pattern, its position's been pretty far to the north. Well, as we're watching, we're going to be seeing quite a bit of change in the west and here in the east, where we're going to almost flip-flop this pattern here uh, in the near term. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. But as I walk through this video, I'm going to do the long range first, get back into the short range uh, here in the middle part of the video, and I'll finish up with the content I usually deliver for South America. So let's get right to it. Okay, the last seven days of precipitation. Uh, has really been a product of where the, the jet stream has been targeting British Columbia. And we've had, of course, some absolutely detrimental flooding in that area. And the map that you're looking at here shows you um, precipitation uh, from a data set in Canada called CAP over the last seven days. I just want to make a point here. There are some places right here along the coast uh, that actually saw well above what you see here, which is 180 millimeters of rainfall. In fact, some places saw up to 500. And just for reference, 500 millimeters is about 19 inches of rainfall. So this has been just a massive flooding problem here as the jet streams targeted that area. Now, we are going to be seeing some movement in that jet stream position. I'm going to talk about why in just a few seconds here. But I want to first also bring up to speed on uh, where we are in snowfall. Uh, so this map shows you accumulated snowfall departure from average uh, through the end of November. A couple places to point out here. Uh, front range of the Rocky Mountains, you know, Denver went through November without snowfall. Uh, you get right here into the northern plains, we've had limited snowfall, and especially in Montana. But early season, we had some picked up here in the Sierra Nevada and in the Cascades. And we're going to be looking for a lot of change in this map moving forward because compared to the last couple of years through this point in the year, we saw a completely different picture overall. And if we broaden this out and just look at it across the northern hemisphere, one of my favorite websites here from Rutgers University, it's their global snow lab, they show the, the daily departure from the climatological average. And you can see the effect of those warmer conditions here. We see a large area here in our northern plains and into the Rocky Mountains and the Canadian Prairie where we have, you know, compared to average, uh, you know, a negative anomaly. So this is going to be something that we need to be seeing some significant change in as we progress forward throughout this winter. All right, very quick kind of rundown on what we're going to be expecting here. We're going to continue to stay mild across much of the southern and central part of the United States in the near term over the next five days. But there's quite a bit of colder air that's being separated by that very powerful jet stream winds that are riding through here. We're going to start to see some shifts in this coming up very soon. So we're going to take the storm track away from running along the U.S.-Canada border and start to dip these systems a bit farther to the south and have them pulling into you know, the Midwest and eventually into the Northeast. From there, I do want to show you what we're expecting in terms of precipitation over the next week. You see, that's that clipper track we were talking about. But do notice we will be starting to bring in precipitation into a very dry region, the lower Mississippi River Valley, through the Tennessee Valley over toward the Carolinas here. This is going to be an increase in rainfall uh, that's going to be substantial compared to what we've had. But it also brings some disruptive rain into parts of the eastern Corn Belt and the northeast as well. We will watch in the month of December, mid-December and beyond, how we're going to start to increase our chances for precipitation in California as well. And I still kind of rest a lot of my forecast on the teleconnection coming out of the tropics. So I've been watching what's going on, you know, with the, with the polar jet stream here running across much of, you know, the northern hemisphere. And I still think that the strongest connection right now, in other words, what's controlling it, has a lot to do with what's going on with these ocean temperatures. 
I believe our La Nina is reaching a peak, and so we're going to watch the edge of those trade winds get about to this point, all right? What I expect is that through December, not too much change in this map. But as we get into January, February, we're going to start to see these cooler waters begin to back off. We're also going to have to watch this area right in through here because that's been quite critical to the speed of the jet stream as it's coming across uh, the Pacific. In other words, that contrast between the cold water here and the warm water there has helped to you know, extend and, and, and kind of perpetuate the very strong winds in the polar jet stream. So that's, these are two areas I'm going to be watching very carefully. I just want to show you something. You know, I'm keeping an eye on the polar vortex. And what we watch for here is we watch for any deviation from this line. That would be the average strength of the polar vortex. So remember, when it's strong, which it is right now, we tend to not have massive disruptions in terms of very cold temperatures. It's when the values really start to dip down like this, like they did last year in the month of January, that we have to be on the lookout because that could signal a downstream uh, problematic colder outbreak. So I just want to let you know, right at this point in December, polar vortex is behaving. It's, it's actually quite normal for this time of year. So I come back to the main story here. I think it's a lot of the connection coming out of the tropics. And you know if you've been watching my content now for the last several weeks that this has been a map we've looked at a lot. So what are we going to do? We're going to go from today all the way through the next 15 days. And what you notice is where those trade winds are meeting up with these westerly winds here in the tropics sits right on top of phase six and phase seven. Now when this La Nina begins to let go, you're going to see two things happen. One. All of a sudden, the trades here, these blue colors, are going to back off, and the MJO is going to pop out over into phase 8, 1, and then do a reset back to the Indian Ocean. That'll be the first thing that happens. When that occurs, we will get a substantial cold air outbreak in the eastern two-thirds of North America while the west goes warm. That's the typical teleconnection pattern. But we're not seeing that anytime soon. Over the next uh, 15 days or so, we see that the MJO wants to live right here in phases six and seven. Doesn't seem to deviate too far from that. In fact, the new long range ECMWF also keeps it here. So do you notice how it's not tossing this way out over here into phase eight and one, which means even through the beginning of January, we're gonna see this La Nina maintaining strength. It will be after the new year that I think it's gonna to start to pull back. It'll reach a peak between now and then and start to pull back at that point. So what do we expect? Well, all that uh, change we're talking about right now means this. Uh, as we work our way forward into uh, you know, the month of December here, if the La Nina stays in phase six, we could let that cold air out at times through the Canadian prairie. But overall, we're gonna see broader warmth because of the jet stream flow that's gonna extend into this region. That's, that's the general consensus behind this pattern. What I'm most interested in seeing is how quickly we get into phase seven. And we've talked about this a lot lately. It gives us a very extended branch of the Pacific jet stream. It has a better chance at getting here into California because phase six is no good for California. Phase seven is. We could also see an active storm track through here around a subtropical ridge that's going to sit over the southeast. Now, nowhere in this pattern, phase six or seven, with a La Nina, do we see the development of a subtropical jet. And my point behind telling you that is that when we look at these next three forecasts, you'll see that much of the south stays dry. So let's just start here with the Climate Prediction Center. This was their one-month outlook that was released late on Monday, and it's looking at the month of December. This is very La Nina. This is a, a perfect analog to La Nina. Mild south, dry south. The active corridors are in the Pacific Northwest, coming out of the Canadian Prairie, and wrapping here up into the eastern, or much of the Great Lakes. So this is an area that we'll watch carefully. That's what happens when we're missing the subtropical component of the jet stream. That's one that comes from Hawaii and targets, you know, like this across the United States. That's forecast number one. Extended forecast number two is going to come from the CFS V2. This is one of the pieces that the National Weather Service uses to make that pre previous forecast graphic. Week three, December 16th through the 22, we continue to see drier conditions south. All right. As we then get into week four, that begins to shrink better on shore flow into California, according to the CFS V2. Is that same thing echoed in the European run? It actually is. This is the whole of the 30-day time period of December 10 to January 10. 
And it's also a, a very La Nina-like, except it is attempting to return moisture down here to the Great Basin and over into California. Normally, we don't see that. So I would expect the above average precipitation like you see in the Northwest. I expect near normal here from the Canadian Prairie through the Northern Plains and an active Tennessee and Ohio River Valley storm track. This is also quite typical of La Nina, dry from Texas, let me excuse me, drier from Texas over into the Southeast. So these components in these three different forecasts, I believe right now are most strongly connected to the position and strength of the La Nina. In other words, I'm not seeing any external factors that are dominating the forecast at this point, but I'll watch for them. And when they show up, I'll be sure to, to let you know about it. So that gets us through the long range. Let's now go take a look at the things that are controlling the near term. And I'm gonna start here by looking at where this jet stream pattern is gonna to get to by the middle of the month. Because this is what we think it'll do. By the middle of the month, the models, when we average them together, are really trying to paint a picture of something like this. And there's that south uh, east ridge right here that could start to change that flow to be coming out of the southwest like this across the midsection of the country. Now it's gonna take a while to get there. Okay, if we go back in time, very La Nina, or excuse me, very uh, phase six MJO view of things right here. Still a ridge in the Gulf of Alaska by the time we get into early next week, but that begins to break down December 8th, 9th, and 10th, and you can start to see where that colder air is gonna come out in those deeper troughs that are gonna to start to move. So that's, that's what we have to focus on in this near-term forecast. Good way to do it, look at both models at the same time, all right? So GFS is on the left, Europeans on the right. And we've already seen through Thursday. So why don't we get this right up here to early Friday morning? Still have some leftover snow showers coming right in through here in both models, coming into the Eastern Great Lakes early in the morning here, or excuse me, the, the whole of the Great Lakes. As we then play through the day on Friday and get into Saturday, we now start to see our first uh, bigger system, rather than a bunch of little clippers, our first slower and larger system coming through parts of Montana. So this is Saturday evening and it emerges here and the models are just a little different on the timing and the spacing. Do you notice it? The Europeans got more snow coming into southern uh, Manitoba and hitting northern North Dakota and Minnesota, whereas the GFS, a little farther south on that low pressure center, brings more snow to the Red River Valley of the north, okay? So this is now Sunday morning, getting into Sunday uh, midday and Sunday evening. I will be watching through the Mid-South right in through here for the potential for storms on Sunday evening. We're gonna keep an eye on that. But more snow spreading into this part of the Great Lakes and into Eastern Ontario. So by the time we get out to Monday morning, getting into Monday midday, right about here. Both models kind of got the timing right on this. See that frontal position there? So a cold shot coming in behind that. And we're gonna watch for storms all along this front Sunday into Monday, okay? Well, that system curls up into the Northeast and that will return snow into the interior of the Northeast, also through Eastern Ontario and Quebec. But we see the next system brewing here. Do you see how it's come farther to the South? So on Monday night to Tuesday, this one spreads snow into the Pacific Northwest, into Montana, into the, you know, the central Rockies here, including some snow in California. And that system emerges on the plains. And we still have yet to see really what this is going to shape up and look like. But by Tuesday evening, we got more potential for storms in eastern Texas and the lower Mississippi River Valley. And we could be putting some snow. Take a look at this from um, Iowa into Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan again. European is a little bit farther to the south of the GFS, which has got more snow in Wisconsin and Michigan. But that system pulls on through. And again, I'm gonna be watching out for the chances for severe storms here midweek next week on the tail end of this front and another shot at cold air. And already at this point, next Wednesday, we've reloaded the Northwest, bringing another system through. That's how those deeper troughs evolve and dig into the Northwest first and then eject into the plains. So by next Thursday, getting out here toward, let's just stop it there Thursday evening. One system exits and the next one's following it. The models begin to separate a bit though once we get out this far. So we're gonna let them kind of do that and we'll take a look at how much they agree here in the near term. So why don't we talk snow first? I'll just play forward for you the European model. We got uh, this system coming through here this weekend. So that's where the European model is putting down some snow. And then the second system comes right in through here on Monday while the first system exits. By the way, possibility of six to 12 inches of snow in through here as we're watching this first system leave Sunday into Monday. 
And then what we've got as we just played this, let's just take it out a week. Here we go, all the way out to next Thursday morning. And we can see some decent snows in the interior of New England, some places picking up better than four inches. This active corridor in through here, but now we're returning more snow to the Cascades and the Northern Rockies. GFS, just to kind of give you, uh, you know, the, the same forecast time period, very similar. Ready? European, GFS. That's some pretty good agreement overall between the two models on the snow through the next uh, few days. What about on the precipitation side of it? Let's just walk through this as well. So getting through Friday into Saturday, this weekend, there we start to see the first chances of rain in a long time returning to this part of the Mid-South and the lower Mississippi River Valley. Our clipper track sets up right here, okay? So this is through Monday morning, and as we spread through the day on Tuesday, the next system comes in. Now watch, we're adding Tuesday into Wednesday. Look at the rain coming in to parts of the south and southeast. And then we know there's another system following that that shows up here toward the end of that time period. So we put it all together, compare our models, and this is what you got. Taking the European and the GFS and comparing them, you just notice these colors in through here, that's where the GFS is wetter. The greens and blues are where the Europeans wetter. So there are differences, especially right around the Tennessee Valley, where the GFS is much more aggressive on the precipitation, but the European, a broader area of wetter weather. So that gets us through this next week. As I mentioned, getting out there to day 10, you can already see the shift happening. And we got a low that's exiting here and another one coming on shore, which means looking out there at that time period. That's the first one leaving, okay, getting into week two. And then as we stretch this fully out into week two, which gets us all the way out here, gosh, to de uh, December the 17th, now we see better precip for much of Northern California and the Northwest. We're gonna have an active storm track in the midsection of the country. So I'll be watching out for this very carefully. Why don't we finish up with some temperatures? Talk about South America and we'll wrap this video up. It was very warm on Thursday. Okay, that downslope flow under that big ridge, we were 20 to 30 degrees above average here. As we work our way into Friday's highs, again, from Texas to Missouri, another very, very warm day. Only cooler air still exiting in the northeast. From Friday into Saturday, that's our temperatures compared to average, and then into Sunday and Monday. Now, Monday's that first frontal passage, so knocking us back toward normal here. But then we go from that back over to a mild pattern in the southern part of the United States where we turn back to some cooler conditions here in the north. From Tuesday into next Wednesday, next front passes through bringing a cold swipe here through parts of the Midwest and Great Lakes. Now, as we stated, the temperature pattern, once we get out there day five through 10, starts to bring in more colder air while the ridge over the southeast back towards Texas keeps this region warmer than average. So please, if, if you can, get out and enjoy that warmer weather in through the midsection of the country through the remainder of this week because it's going to shift around once we get into next week. And looking out there longer term, this would be day 10 through 15 in the forecast, getting us past mid-month. And we continue to see that colder air stored up here. And what I'm going to say is once we get that MJO past phase 7, we will be able to let this out and get it here across the eastern part of the United States. But there's some pretty good analog support with this temperature pattern. Just looking at some of those analogs, we look out there into that day 9 through day 11 time period, and we do see the more mild conditions here to the east with the colder air returning to the west. And again, that colder air is brought in by these deeper troughs we talked about. So that's a pattern shift in the Pacific Northwest. That's it. Let's talk South America and wrap this one up. We've been discussing all week long. The forecast trended drier last week and is continuing to show up in this area. So this goes from Mato Grosso do Sol through Parna, Rio Grande do Sol, parts of Sao Paulo, showing up very dry. The Parana River, which runs through here in that whole basin, is showing up dry. So that includes Cordoba and Santa Fe. It's been a very consistent forecast. And I'll tell you something. What you see right here is just, you know, the, the prototypical La Nina pattern. Better rains to the north, drier to the south. And the question is, are we going to continue to see this because the longer range models still point for the next 40 days or so for this region to stay dry. So we're going to start to see some concerns here about productivity uh, in this land with a lack of rainfall coming through here because Argentina and southern Brazil and pockets of southern Brazil continue to show up dry. I'm going to watch all of it. We'll be back to you again on Monday. And on Monday, be sure to tune in because I'll have all of the brand new long-range European model data that comes out on the 5th. You'll see it in my video on Monday. 
Hey, I appreciate your attention. I also want to thank you for letting me have some extra time tonight. Have a good weekend. Thank you.